Okay, so as the topic is design for and by users, I mean, that's what everybody these days is doing. Um, everybody's customer-centered or even user-centered design, uh, startups, incumbents, even public organizations. If you ask the CIO, CEO, but typically that's where it stops. If you ask somebody else in the organization and not the CEO who has read the latest management bestseller, the organizations tend to be far less user-centered. And um, in this talk, I wish to uh, convey some of the insights we've gained over the last 12 years about um, what kind of issues are relevant in actually being um, generally user-centered or engaging with users. And um, um, I've, as you can see, I've, I've tried to be a bit pro uh, provocative um, in, in making it um, sort of rather dire um, um, a title. But really what we were interested in was that, well, how do end users matter in innovative e-health design? We know that, for instance, in most pharmaceuticals, um, the pa innovation path goes from laboratory to testing to market, and there tends to be relatively little end user involvement in their design or even throughout the innovation life cycle. At the same time, uh, there are fields, fields such as surgical instruments where uh, it, it has been suggested that up to 80% of the innovations actually originate from the end users themselves. So our concern was really on what do we know about e-health and more specifically, what do we know about uh, end user involvement and how it matters in e-health throughout its life cycle. For the majority of the studies that there are, focus on user involvement in moments of co-design or in concept design or in later appropriation of the technologies. Very few studies have been sort of able to systematically sort of reconstruct the innovations throughout their life cycles and, um, and to look at what is the overall sort of overall role of users and what's the sort of their um, full impact um, um, on the emerging innovations. And that's what we tried to do. We went pains through obser observing and interviewing, digging up the documents about um, innovations um, and, and be, uh, to, to provide this sort of a full unified picture of end user involvement um, in various e-health applications. These applications cover monitoring alarm devices for elderly, um, software for diabetes professionals, new clinical liquid handling apparatus, uh, medical imaging technologies, um, and so forth. In this talk, I uh, wish to highlight just six lessons. What I would like to do really is to, um, to go through this product replacement here for I just, I'm a proud author of a book, um, but I guess 350 pages really can't fit into the TED talk. So, um, so I just want to distill just few key issues and if you get interested, um, there is some more of this in, in various places. So the first lesson um, is the provo sort of provoca provocative title, but, but with some backing to it. Um, I've labeled it, it's do or die, for the simple reason that none of the innovations we studied became viable without any users. Out of the lot we studied, only one went bust. The e-grocery shopping for handicapped and elderly was cancelled roughly about a year after its introduction to the two severe usability problems. And that happened to be the only one where there was no end user involvement in the design or even after the, uh, after the market launch and first appropriations. Now that's kind of interesting. What I find really interesting though is that in all the other projects, there was a major redirection in, the, uh, in what was designed and how the business around what was designed was, was conceived after users got involved. So had user involvement not taken place, all of the other innovations that we studied would have gone prob probably would have gone bust as well. And now, this may not be interesting as such, um, but the fact remains that when we're choosing the technologies to technology projects to follow, we were picking winners. We did 
with, we engaged only with projects that had already won innovation prizes, that were already well recognized and sort of seen as um, um, by others and then by us as worthy of serious attention. So if this is a matter of, of that it's a matter of do or die, then it seems, to, seems quite sensible to draw the first implication being, well, begin sooner rather than later. The second lesson is more, uh, starts to go into um, how then to do it. It recapitulates some of the issues we know from uh, open source um, uh, development and participatory design, but with an interesting little sort of subtle and interesting differences. There were two things that all the projects needed to have in order to prosper in any way. First could be called a dedicated core actor, a company or dedicated user group that incorporated, condensed, and communicated design iterations onto the design. The second could be called an extensive user community um, that represent the variation in context of use and occupational groups using the application. Let me give you a little, uh, a little example from um, database programs for diabetes care. Um, the project that we followed closely was developed in intense col uh, collaboration between um, a, a software startup and an extensive user commu um, community from multiple clinics and multiple hospital districts in Finland. Um, roughly after five years, the company started to withdraw from collaboration for they saw that, uh, they regarded that the product was ready enough and wanted to more or less package it at that point. Most of the users at this point were, did not see the, uh, the project in, in the same terms. They wished to pursue with the de uh, development, but as the co company withdrew from the collaboration, the user's innovativeness veined quite rapidly as well. No one is picking up their ideas and, soon, and, and sort, of, sort of iterative um, um, design was no longer happening. And soon enough, um, the, their, their innovative, the, the highly innovative users became not so very in, innovative or even sort of stagnant users in regards to their, what sort of contributions were fall, uh, flowing from them to the, uh, from them to the company. While that highlights a sort of dedicated core actor issue there, um, the diabetes databases um, highlight quite well the need for the extensive user community as well. For in the history of this project lied a very peculiar phenomena, which I think is common in healthcare in other countries as well. And it's not, um, um, my hunch would be that it's definitely not limited to diabetes in diabetes databases in Finland, namely the graveyards of technology. When we, st we discovered that some of the folks who had been developing uh, this project had uh, tried to build similar systems before, and when we uh, really dug into the issue, it turned out that in uh, 23 hospital districts that there are in Finland, 21, in 21 of them um, there had been um, um, database programs for diabetes care developed previously, and one was in active use. So basically there was 20 withdrawn projects. Why were they withdrawn? Well, they, they were developed by a specialist. Um, and they were very good. Um, uh, the, the major reason for their withdrawal was that they were very good in what, how, how, design, how diabetes ought to be treated. They catered very well for the, for the encompass, they were encompassing in what sort of data ought to be recorded and so forth. But in practical, actual, daily mundane use, where those programs were to be used for years, they were too cumbersome. So the lesson here is, instead of just relying, and those people were clearly what von Hippel would call lead users. Uh, they had all the, all the ca characteristics um, that, that they are. They, I could argue that they were sort of um, leading edge, lead, some of them were leading edge lead users there. Only when they formed an extensive community and uh, included um, other occupational groups as well, did they become, uh, did, could they produce a program that was more viable. So the first implication here is that draw from the actual range of userships, e-health applications are 
used by typically used by multiple occupational groups um, and are used in multiple contexts of use and you need to uh, somehow accommodate that in who gets to uh, who gets to um, contribute into the design and then cultivate the kinds of inputs that you are getting now the kinds of inputs that you're getting is the lesson number three and that's that is very easy that's many things we were surprised and it might become uh, and, and certainly the companies that we were studying were surprised that indeed users were a source of rede uh, redesigning uh, uh, redirecting design and business concepts um, in um, in all these cases they were active in iterating user interfaces or at least uh, providing um, a great thrust in how to um, iterate them. They were key in integrating use with um, other adjacent systems and, and thinking through how, how to actually make good uh, use of these technologies as well as what sort of technical solutions would be needed in order to redeem the value um, um, in, um, in the new technology. And they were active in coming up with new uses, new procedures, and new design ideas, oftentimes related to the kinds of new uses that they were uh, envisioning for these technologies. So the implication here I wish to draw is that foster a range of inbo inputs, in a sense, don't box your users to just, for instance, technical testing, for then much, much is lost from what they actually can offer for the innovative um, design project. Equally, um, a, a sort of lesson four is that equally um, don't limit the timing of seeking user involvement. Clearly, initial concept design was an important place in, in, um, to involve users. There were a lot of good ideas from the users to what to design, and really importantly, I know Jorge is going to talk um, uh, much more engagingly about this, what not to design. In, in the applications that we looked at, uh, looked at um, users were, were key in taking out some of the features that weren't uh, desirable in, in the early visions, and that was, was crucial in these technologies. However, just as importantly, um, after the first generation was out in a market was the really crucial time for user involvement in all of the projects. For this was, a, this was a time when multiple contexts of use Typically, new kinds of uses, um, uh, um, intricate coordination between um, uh, patients and, and various occupational groups became visible. The actual context of use, uh, context of use became um, visible. Typically, a lot of the ideas uh, for how to make the technology better, how to fix it, uh, uh, fix its short, shortcomings, and so forth, um, um, uh, surfaced, and then in the design of second or even third generation was the kind of that you find in the textbooks that uh, under the rubrics of participatory design or, um, or uh, customer co-creation, the kind of efficient co-design, efficient testing arrangements where um, there, is this, there is this fantastic flow of an energy from users to designers and back. It typically took years to achieve this. Um, to figure out who are the users uh, to collaborate in more intensively and um, um, and um, um, and by what means and, and so forth. The point here is that this is no one-time knowledge transfer issue. It is an ongoing learning and iteration challenge. One of the reasons why it is so comes with the uh, with the lesson five. Uh, it's pretty much an illustration of some of the themes I've mentioned before already. Um, i tell you a little story that, that highlights many other things. Um, it's about how complementary competencies and contributions from users and designers actually feed onto each other. In the early 90s, a group of developers were coming up with um, a monitoring al alarm device for elderly, pe elderly and disabled people, a wrist-worn device. They went to a fair in Germany uh, where they needed to somehow come up with the visualization or something that would make the technology more appealing. Uh, it was, you know, it sent an alarm maybe once in two weeks, so it was, how, how can you make that appealing in a fair? So they hacked up a sort of a showpiece illustration, literally, a curve, 
um, that showed the, the physiological activity of the, of, the, of the user. They didn't think it would have any usefulness. However, users picked up this, um, this, this curve. They started using it in, in making calls for, uh, for these, these alarms um, on seeing how the, uh, uh, ch their charges uh, condition had developed. They started to make, uh, in, uh, um, draw indications of, of too uh, deep sleep medication or too heavy sleep medication, which led to more serious sleep research, which in turn led to compar uh, comparisons with gold standard devices, which in turn saved the company. For they had struggled for some time at this point uh, to establish medical validity for their algorithms. Now, of course, that's a nice story, but how it uh, then continues is that, well, developers then picked up the stuff that users were doing and started uh, building long-term graph analyses, automated graph analyses, and so forth, um, and were able to return the kind of proactive measures uh, that they were seeking out um, um, o over 10 years earlier and two generations of the device earlier, uh, but not through automation, but augmentation of nurses' work. So this is what I mean by complementary co uh, competences and contributions. So the lesson six and the final lesson, I hope I still have time to go through this, is that collaboration evolves. And those who work with end users um, need to be prepared for this. Um, in all the cases that we have looked at, there is a first sort of a, um, a phase of accumulation of functionality and insight onto what ought to be designed and how. This can take a surprisingly long time uh, we all recognize this is the case when you were building uh, in, during the concept design, uh, even in the first protos, but in fact it tended to continue from um, a first version in the market, oftentimes la later, later, later uh, relabeled as the, um, as the, um, as the fir first working proto, uh, the second version in, in, the, in the market. And then um, giving away this sort of accumulation of insight giving away to what, we, what one of our informants was calling cacophony management. When multiple different uh, users were setting different um, um, sort of competing requirements and so forth. Um, and typically this phase be became predominant after um, um, at least when a th uh, third generation or um, a sort of already quite well working technology was present and then there was were competing uh, multiple contexts that had somewhat different competing uh, needs. So the, the implication here is that there is a journey from accum uh, accumulation to, uh, to cacophony management that needs to be prepared for. Okay, so I would wish to thank you for, for sharing these ideas with me and I go them just quickly through once more um, as six things is Six things is a bit much for, for one thing. So end user involvement indeed appears to be a sort of do or die issue, begin sooner. Cultivate and draw from a range of usership, from the actual usership. Foster a range of inputs from bug fixing to redefining the project to, to, to rethink the business case and so forth. It is no one time knowledge transfer issue, but a learning and iteration over time. It is, do not wait to get a final and full specification out of the users. That's not going to happen. Rather, it's a matter of iterating through con complementary contributions. And at that, it is a journey from accumulating uh, insight to cacophony management and packaging. And when there is a major redesign, back to accumulating insight. Thanks for engaging with this talk, and hopefully, thanks for engaging with the users in the future. <laughs>